I'd like to welcome Angel Kyoto Williams. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Uh, so good evening. And uh, good evening. Good evening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the majority of the folks in the room are leaders and we are exploring what it means to be authentic leaders and for me, one of the most um, prominent things, the thing that comes first is really to be present. And so it's so very important for us to really be able to express our presence when we choose to. So I thank you for that. Uh, I'm very grateful to be here. I'm very grateful that Naropa keeps tolerating my coming back, making, uh, you know, a few waves here and there uh, as I go. And uh, that for me is also the sign of a kind of um, authenticity within the institution, right? It's, you know, to be an authentic leader in, is not so much about that you have everything right and you have everything together, but rather you're willing to confront and address those things that as you as you come to realize that you d you don't know those things right and uh, and and actually set yourself forward to find out right it becomes like uh, the quest for leadership is very much about the quest for what what it is that I'm unaware of and how can I become a, a fuller individual and for me, that's what our topic this evening is about, about how, to, how it is that we create inclusivity in the workplace. But I think before we get to how we create inclusivity, it's important to think a little bit about why. And I'm not an expert in any way on uh, diversity in the workplace, but I, I picked up a few little statistics just to ground the conversation that generally science believes that it is in fact better that to have diversity to have a, a variety of opinions and perspectives and worldviews and worldviews uh, is better not just because it's good because it is it actually improves performance it improves innovation it imp imp improves even financial performance which isn't usually the marker that i look at but i know that people that are in business uh, do and and consider that important uh, important so i'll just share a few statistics just to ground the conversation that in 2006 there's a study that uh, of standard and poor's composite 1500 that showed that, at, that on average, female representation in top management led to a $42 million increase in firm value. And in 2003, they surveyed 177 national banks and looked at diver it, racial diversity, at financial performance and innovation, and it was very clear that in increases in racial diversity were related to financial performance and increased innovation. So you could, they could see that diversity correlated to performance in a wide variety of areas. But uh, a, a few researchers got together and they said, well, okay, so it correlates, but it doesn't prove anything. So they came up with this a game, and it's a, a murder mystery, and particularly they looked at how racial diversity in particular impacted small group decision making. So they had a group and they decided, they gave everyone the same information, right? So all of, all of the groups broken up had the same information. They pulled people from three different universities to do this. And each member of the group then had specific information, right? And in order to solve the mystery, you had to discuss the information that you had. So each small group then had to discuss with each other so they could figure out between the shared information and the individually held information who was, who was responsible for the murder. And what they found is that the groups that had no diversity 
did not perform nearly as well as the groups that had racial diversity. And the main reason that they determined that was is because when people assume that they're the same, literally their processing of information actually shuts down. So they, they stopped processing the information. And further, another uh, university study, again, like mixed uni different universities got together and they uh, had a bunch of groups that were racially diverse to have discussions about social issues. And so they, you know, it could be uh, welfare, it could be uh, housing discrimination, any number of things. But the researchers themselves wrote up dissenting opinions. And it was the job of different folks in the groups to present the dif dissenting opinions. They had black folks present dissenting opinions and they had white folks present dissenting opinions. In the groups in which the black people presented the dissenting opinions, there ended up being a greater understanding and increased innovation and more ideas about how to address the problems. When it came to the groups in which the exact same opinion, but dissenting, was presented by someone like them, people simply didn't listen to the information. They didn't listen as well to the information. And so this sort of like a basic sense of at a gut level, right? I mean, at a, at a performance level, we can see that diversity is important. The reason that inclusivity and diversity are challenging is two sides of the same coin. It's harder. And so people work harder when they expect there's going to be a different perspective. So automatically, if I get in a group and I'm like, oh, there's a South Asian woman in this group, Right? I have to begin to think differently than if I'm with a group of, you know, sister girls, right? So I get a bunch of sister girls and I'm like, oh, you know, we all know we're talking the same language and I code switch around the language that I'm using and I have to actually think differently if there's an Asian man in the group. If he's, whether he's, if he's Chinese or Japanese, I have to think differently, right? And so I actually have to work harder. And that working harder is both what creates space for innovation and uh, a, a, a much broader perspective in terms of how we are thinking, but it is also the thing that makes people resist. Right? Because we just don't want to work hard. We're lazy. And so what I like to think about in terms of what we're up to as authentic leaders is beyond just the sense of performance, like what is going on at a heart level, right? What is, what is it that happens for people and can happen for people that would make this hard work worthy? Well, it's kind of... I think it's uh, in the clue of it is when people expect difference, right? They actually turn on and tune in better. But the other thing that they expect is that they can bring their own difference, right? So the aspects of themselves that would usually fall in line with the expectations of the dominant group are allowed to come forth. So as authentic leaders, the presence of diversity, the choice to be inclusive, is not just about getting those different people and making sure that they're included, because we're such good people. It's about being more authentic ourselves. It is about giving ourselves permission through the presence of others that are different from, our, from us, to sift, right, to find and to have stimulated even, right? We didn't, we, it's like we lose parts of ourselves when we get into sameness. And that's by design, I think, right? We have hundreds of years of history in this country that set up what I like to call a politics of disbelonging. And that politics of disbelonging says, through a, a, a variety of mechanisms that go back to 
in fact, pre-slavery, says that if you want to belong, you have to make sure to exclude these others. If you want to belong to the owning class, to the privileged class, to the class that has the opportunity for more access, to the class of privilege in various forms. You have to join us in making sure that others do not belong. So people are essentially, Susan said that I'm, I confront a little bit. So essentially people, because I mean, let's pause for a moment. Wouldn't we say that it's natural for human beings to be curious about other human beings? There's, of course, there's tribalism, and there's been tribalism since the beginning of known time, of recorded time. But we're also curious, right? We're curious, actually, about difference. And if, you know, anyone doesn't believe that, they can just see what happens once you put different peoples together, right? You have to start having miscegenation laws <laughs> because people get real curious real quick. They get deeply curious, <laughs> right? And so to maintain purity, we... And what maintaining purity is about is like recognizing that people are curious about differences and we're stimulated by, di by differences in all kinds of ways, in all kinds of places. And so it's natural and organic to us to be curious about one another, to develop a sense of care and concern from one another, to recognize pain and suffering in one another, and to want to respond to that pain and suffering. And yet within our society, as we, as we are all well aware, we have en enormous patterns of that curiosity and that organic care and compassion being cut off at rates that are are pretty astounding if you think about it. And so what I often have wondered is what, what does that, what, 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 if I just don't think, if I don't go with the idea that these people are just evil, right? And I have been in the Dharma now longer than I've not been, and so I'm, I'm pretty strongly seated in the ideal of basic goodness. It's, it's truly my worldview. It's how I hold people. It's how I relate to people. And so the whole we're essentially evil thing doesn't work for me. And so in probing that, that's where I came to this politics of disbelonging. And to follow the thread of laws, of practices, of policies that kept taking a, a, a groups of people, dividing them along lines of color, along lines of ethnicity, along lines of gender, along lines of things that just is nobody's business like sex, sexual orientation, right? Around gender expression and gender performance and kept saying, well, if you want to belong to the privileged class, you have to trade something. Your humanity. So to deny, to deny mm, our natural urge to include, to be, uh, curious, to be open, to allow ourselves to freely and unfetteredly to love one another is to trade in our humanity for privilege. And of course we know that most of us are not doing that consciously. Hence the role of the authentic leader 
is to pierce through the veil right that has been really i like you know say i like to say that you know we've all been hoodwinked and bad, bamboozled as spike lee would say that that politic that has been developed over centuries is something that we've all been caught in the web of and just as as leaders our role is to begin to uh, at, to to assume a position in in which other people can model and emulate we are a model and other people can emulate us in order to find ourselves in an authentic way so that we know what it is we're passing on we have to probe these areas in which we've been veiled right? the truth of exclusion in our communities in our society in our workplaces has been hidden from us the reasons for it have been hidden from us so we have more than just financial gain and performance we have more than just innovation we at the very core of it have our own humanity to contend with to grapple with wanting to draw back for ourselves right to reclaim for ourselves how many of us can say with honesty that there's no part of us that we feel would be um unwelcome if we were to share that aspect of ourselves in our workplaces how many of us are holding something back that maybe even rubs right that we maybe we rub up against it all the time whether it is speaking out about something that we see whether it is something about our heritage something about our history something about what's just what's happening in our lives just what's happening in our lives and we said spend so much time in our workplace it's sort of unfathomable that we would not want our workplaces to be a place of wholeness right that doesn't mean that we have to go through all of our issues at work right and but the fact that we feel we would not they would not be accepted right means that we have to cut a little bit of ourselves off now let's let's be brave how many of us have something that we feel like we cut off in in order to feel that we can actually be accepted in our workplace and so if when we create spaces of inclusion it generates a, an openness a receptivity in out of which creativity and innovation arise maybe just maybe some of those aspects of yourself would also then have permission to show up to maybe that different perspective that you hold as a woman would feel like it would have more room once there are more asian folks there maybe it's just because you and the asian women go together and talk about something that you never get to talk about talk about with the men and it sparks something and now you have something to share now you have something to bring into the room maybe the fact of the very um commonly recognized it's not across the board there you know every a generalization is just that but the vociferousness of of many black folks right strong willingness to vocalize things urges you to bring your voice forward in spaces in in which usually the expectation is that you hold back 
I had a great example of this. I sit on the board of a, an environmental organization. I've, I've done so for 10 years, and uh, they have a, they're, they're a wonderful organization. Uh, they, they recently changed their name to STAND. They were formerly Forest Ethics. And they have one of their ideals is best idea wins. And so they, you know, get their staff in a room and everyone, you know, puts their ideas in, but, and best idea wins. But of course, they're attuned to hearing the best idea presented in a particular way because they're overwhelmingly white men. And so over time, even though the organization was largely founded by women, so over time they've come to understand that they privilege right, the louder voices. They privilege right, taking a stand. <laughs> of course, this is what their name is now. But they privilege taking a stand. That if you believed in your idea, you would take a stand. And so it has only been through the presence of people of color whose cultures are not oriented towards voicing opinions in that way that created space for the white women to be able to have their voices heard because the white men hadn't taken it in that the women that were white like them wouldn't do things in the same way. When everyone had to work harder, harder to accommodate people of different ethnic backgrounds in which then they knew, oh, that's right, they, you know, South Asians don't jump out and do that often in their culture. S some do, but not everyone. And they, they had people that were uh, more uh, acculturated in that particular way. And then it created more space. It was like, oh, we don't, the best idea does not come in a loud, frontal way. Right? It doesn't come with a sort of like prepackaged argument that has all of the T's crossed and the I's dotted. It comes sometimes with heart and emotion rather than just rationale. So we all benefit. Now to encourage ourselves, what, you know, one of the things that we've been looking at in, in terms of uh, working with d diversity, equity, and, and inclusion, which is, which is generally how I would say it, rather than just diversity or just inclusivity, or, and certainly not equality, that we'll, we'll talk tomorrow about why, why equality is a fallacy. Uh, but diversity, equity, and inclusion. When we, when we work with it, we, we um, oh, I went off to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, so <laughs> I'll come back to the, um, what One of the things that happens is, is happening in, in the, the organization is that we are beginning to understand right, a much wider array of perspectives, right? We're beginning to understand across the board that there are different perspectives, that there are different ways. And e the most important thing is that we, ha those of us that are in dominant positions, right, have to work harder in order to recognize the difference that shows up because generally we don't have to, right? If we're in positions of privilege, if we're in positions of dominance, we literally don't have to notice difference. However, I'm, I feel pretty certain that if we as an organization, which is the only reason that I engage with this effort 
over the last 10 years, very slow, with this organization is because the, one of their other core, the core aspects of their work is their, as an environmental organization, they're situated in mindfulness. I es essentially don't get involved in any way with organizations or, or projects or programs around the conversation of diversity, equity, and inclusion without mindfulness. So for me, they go hand in hand, and it's why I happily come back to Naropa, because mindfulness is embedded in the culture and the pursuit, really, of Naropa as an institution. And I say this because one of the things that mindfulness brings, and you know, I kind of I'm, I'm using mindfulness in a in a in the broad sense to include you know meditative practices, uh, somatic practices, awareness of body. Is that it creates a the thing that is probably most necessary to really engage, it, it creates the foundation to really engage and begin to engage, I, I would say more rapidly with difference is this, the space, right? The sense of pause between your, re, your internal reality and the reality that's going on outside. So one of the ways in which that's been seen is that mindfulness helps people that participate in implicit bias tests to do better in those tests. So do people know what the implicit bias test is? So Harvard created a project called uh, Project Implicit, and they, they created a, a test called the implicit bias test. And you should you know, r leave here right away and, uh, and after I'm done. <laughs> and, and go and uh, just Google it, it's very easy to find, it's project implicit bias. And there's many, there's many different tests. And this is scary business for some of us, and, right? It's a scary business for me. I finally was like, okay, I'm just not gonna assume, I'm gonna go and take the test myself. And uh, you are tested for your implicit bias. Implicit bias. I'm talking about the bias you don't know about. Uh, along lines of race, gender, age, not all at once, right? So you choose the different tests. When it first started, it was race, and they've expanded. So you check and test for your implicit bias with different categories of uh, diversity. And one of the things that they've come to realize is that people that, and I'm going to use a certain phrase, people that applied mindfulness, had a, a practice of applied mindfulness, would increase their responses uh, that are more spacious for people of difference, whatever that different category. And it ran across all of the different categories. The reason I said applied mindfulness is because in case folks are paying, you know, not paying attention, with, you know, roughly 50 years of Dharma practice, mindfulness practice in its various forms in America, we haven't yet, you know, aced this thing, <laughs> right? And so there's been lots of practice, but it's been decoupled from an application to social issues. So practice, and some of the most powerful practices, actually, that we have for working with our implicit bias, have not done as well because they've been decoupled from its application in social situations beyond sameness. And so the way that I speak about this is, right, the, the, the lens is shining inside of, right, the bubble. So rather than taking the lens of awareness and having it shine on the whole thing and bring light to the entire thing, when I say the entire thing, the entirety of society, 
the entirety of our intractable social issues, the entirety of global challenges, the entirety of our relationship field, our relational field, the entirety of, of um, assumed ways in which we should, we, we have decided we should act, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, right? Our cultural uh, defaults. We took it inside of the bubble of privilege and practiced it inside there. So we can be mindful and we can be in our workplace and we can still be blind <laughs> until we are willing to draw back that lens to look at ourselves in our entirety in all of our relational fields including at work we without we we will not have the opportunity then to bring these practices to bear they'll operate inside of our privilege inside of our bias inside of our blind spots I love this, you, you, you get to talk about some of these things a couple times and then you're like, oh, there I go, I'm saying that thing again. I'm gonna say it anyway. So we end up with a kinder, gentler suffering, right? Then freedom, liberation from those biases. We end up with a, you know, I mean, any, on any given Sunday, I rather hang out with mindful people, right? Because their 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 stuff is not coarse and it's not overt. And so, just on the surface, I'm going to hang out with mindful people. Uh, but on the other hand, once we get sort of into deeper relationship, they're the most dangerous people I know. because they're invested in the idea of how mindful they are. Anybody know anything about that? So when, so when you take on a practice that has such profound potential without being willing to take it on in a way that is inclusive of you too, you actually become rather dangerous you become a danger to yourself and you become a danger to others. Because at least if you're ignorant, you can just go, oh, I don't know. Right? I just don't know. I didn't know any better. Right? There's space for curiosity. It's like the Zen saying, right? Half, a glass half empty or half full. And so if you imagine yourself already knowing, then you think it's, it's full. And if you're already full, there's no room for new information to be included. There's no room for new perspectives, and that's what one of those studies show. You already know each other. You already know what's happening here, right? You, we quickly decide, we walk into a room, and one of the first things we're doing is scanning for, do we belong? Right? Immediately. That's the first thing you're doing. I, do I belong? Am I going to be safe here? And the way that you make that assessment is by checking for sameness. And so a whole bunch of things just go to sleep, right? So along with the, the uh, aspects of ourselves that are kind of ready for fight or flight, the part of ourselves that's also a, more aware of difference settles down and stops scanning. One of the wonderful things about developing a mindfulness practice where you can create some space in between your perceived reality and the reality outside is that 
you can actually have alertness, right? Alertness to difference, to what's present in the field without flight, fight or flight, right? So you get to have, so we often think like, well, if you're choosing, it's either fight or flight or like relax and collapse. But that's not actually what happens, right? When you have a developed awareness, uh, what you have is a relaxation, but it actually opens up the field rather than being in our fight or flight, you know, appease or freeze mode, then we're narrow and we're kind of looking for the exit. Are you food or I'm food? Which one is this? <laughs> Which one's happening here? Right? But if we can create the space to get past, I forget the number of, like, it's, it's, it's really a lot, just trust me, it's a lot. Our limbic system, right, our old brain is so much faster, and mindfulness creates for us a, a, the space to let our neocortex and frontal lobes start catch up and go, no, not a threat, just a black man. Right? But if it's, again, if it's not applied, right, then we're simply working inside the bubble of our privilege, inside the bubble of our blindness. And the parts of ourselves that are shut down that we lose a access to because we're so comfortable and comfortable doesn't necessarily mean good. It just means comfortable. It's a pattern of comfort, right? And just like uncomfortable doesn't mean bad. But when we drop into that pattern of comfort and we lose access to our awareness of difference, we lose access to a presence to the differences in ourselves a willingness to engage those parts because we're moving right along in that politic. Figuring out how you're gonna stay in. How you're gonna stay in. And essentially, we're experiencing, in one way, we're experiencing a sense of comfort. But it, there's a comfort that's a kind of like deadening, right? An, an, a numbness versus a comfort that is warm and alive. Or even a discomfort that is alive. And I'd rather be alive and a little uncomfortable than numb and really comfortable. If that weren't true for many people, we wouldn't have the drug use that we do. We wouldn't have the Facebook use that we do. <laughs> we, wouldn't have, we wouldn't have the Twitter use that we do. Right? So I want to encourage each of you to just take a moment and turn your inner eye to that aspect of yourself that you know is being left behind, pushed down, set aside, feeling under attended to, unseen, unheard. Whatever it may be. And just allow your mind to wander for a while and to wonder how much more authentic could I be if I would allow that aspect of me 
to be fully present and integrated in who I am. How much more authentic could I be if I created just a little bit more space to include that part of me? And what might it open up for me if I allowed myself to tolerate the discomfort of difference? To actually see people, to really look at them, to really take them in when they're different, rather than that way that we avert our eyes, avert our attention, contract within ourselves, pull back. What would it be like could it impact the way in which I accept members of my family? Would it create more space around the way in which I hold my loved ones? Would I be able to see more about them if I allowed myself to see more in other people? if I could include myself unapologetically and in concert with others, creating the space in which I'm accepted wholeheartedly with all my flaws, my bent places. Could some of those ch places that are challenging have more of an opportunity to be processed, to grow? Could I learn more? Could I get more information about how to help, how to work with myself? If I could just Include it. And by creating that space of inclusivity, little by little, in my own being first, and extending that into my workplace. In which my, thrive, my workplace is, becomes a place of thriving, of acceptance, of love, of openness, of compassion, of genuine care. Would that not be a worthy contribution? I think it would. Thank you.